You are on, on candid camera. Uh, what's that? This? No, we don't need it. Not today, yeah. All right, let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, you are good, gracious, and loving, and merciful. We thank you for your Son, Jesus, who died for our sins and gave us an example of how to live this life for you. We ask you to teach us about the sacrament of baptism, which makes us members of your family. We ask that we would understand and know that we are your beloved children in baptism, that you want a relationship with us now and to eternity. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, got your handouts. Um, the objective for today, where I'm going to be driving us on this journey, um, is that in baptism we belong to God's family. By God's family, I mean the family of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When the waters of baptism poured out upon us, we became his beloved children through adoption. And those of you who haven't been baptized yet, this is what you're looking forward to. So, yes, everyone is created as God's creature, right? His special creation. But we don't become members of his family until we're baptized in his name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We become his beloved adopted children. Jesus, the Son of the Father, is by nature the Son of the Father. So it's natural that he is the Son of the Father. But we are not by nature uh, the same as the Father, as Jesus is, um, meaning that Jesus is God. Um, we participate in that family through adoption. So united with Christ in baptism, the Father looks on us with the same love as he does his Son. Have you ever thought about that? That the Father looks upon you and your baptism or when you will be baptized with the same love that he has for Jesus. That is very powerful because that's a lot of love, an immense amount of love. He says to us in baptism, you are my beloved son. You're, you are my beloved son or my beloved daughter. As his children, if we live our baptismal life we can look forward to an eternal inheritance. So you're probably like, what does that mean? Basically, in plain English, if we live our baptismal life, which is composed of two things, rejecting evil and sin and Satan and choosing the good. So if we live out our baptismal life of rejecting evil and choosing good, we can be assured we will have an eternal inheritance with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's not, baptism is not just a one-time event. It happens in time as an event, but it's meant to be living in us. The graces of our baptism should be living. Um, active in us. So we belong to God's family in baptism. And what is God's family? What? What's that? Trinity. Trinity, yes. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
God's holy f human family is the church. So that's the distinction there. The Trinity is family. They are family to one another. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and from that eternal exchange of love, there is the Holy Spirit. And how do I enter God's family of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? The answer is right there. Baptism. Yeah. We are baptized in the name of the Trinity, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We take on his name, just as nowadays when people are baptized, or not baptized, when they're adopted, they take on the family name. So we take on the family name when we're baptized. This is why the Trinitarian formula is used and why it's important. I was just having a conversation earlier with someone who said that he was baptized into a different Christian denomination. We recognize other Christians' baptisms if they are using the Trinitarian formula. If they baptize, I baptize you so and so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, it's valid. Now, if they decide to baptize with Coca-Cola and in the name of Jesus, I baptize you so and so in the name of Jesus, is that valid? No. So with every sacrament, there's something called matter and form. And you have to have both of those to have a valid sacrament. With the sacrament of baptism, the matter is water. You have to have water. It can't be Coca-Cola or milk or some other substance. It has to be baptism or it has to be water for baptism. And the form is the words used. It has to be the correct words. So as long as that happens, even if it's a different Christian denomination, we recognize that sacrament. So he invites us to be part of this Trinitarian family. God created us out of love, and he wants us to be in friendship with him, in communion with him. And there's a quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sure goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. So, did God need us? Do you think? No. He was purely happy in himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in a communion of perfect love, they were fulfilled. They didn't need us. But out of a plan of sheer goodness, he freely created man so that we could share in his life. So we take on God's name in baptism. A name, every name is important. Names tell us who a person is, their identity, right? So names have meanings, and we're called to live out the meaning of our name. So my name is Sister Caritas, and Caritas is a Latin word for charity or God's love. So I'm called to witness God's love to each of you and to everyone I meet. Right? And my baptismal name was Catherine, which means pure, pure one. And so I was called to live out that purity of heart. Right? And so if you don't know the meaning of your name, you should look it up and find out what your name means. But we take on God's name in our baptism. 
We belong to him. We can always tell who belongs to which family by what? By the family name. When we are baptized, we are initiated or brought into the family of God. We're actually brought into two families in baptism. God's family, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and his human family, the church. Another way we can notice who belongs to a particular family is by resemblance. I don't just mean physical resemblance, but also through mannerisms and character. So, for example, if you saw a picture of my family, you would be able to see physical resemblance. But when you hear my dad speak and the expressions that he uses, and you hear me speak, and the expressions that I use, you would say, oh, they're related. (laughs) Right? So when we follow Jesus and live the baptismal life, we will begin to look like Jesus, act like Jesus, and talk like him. Then the Father sees Jesus in us, and he is well pleased. So united with Christ in baptism, the Father looks on us with the same love as he does his Son. He says to us, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter. Isn't that beautiful? So I wanted to talk about a little bit um, about where baptism comes from and why it's important. First of all, bad news of sin, right? Sin came into the picture, and we needed a savior. Sin closed the gates of heaven, and the blood and water flowing from the side of Christ brings us salvation. So we know that Christ's sacrifice on the cross brings us to heaven, brings us salvation. But when Jesus was pierced on the in, in his side on the cross, blood and water flowed out. The water symbolizes baptism, and the blood symbolizes the Eucharist or Holy Communion. So, there are foreshadowings of the baptism in the Old Testament, meaning prefigurations. And that is from Exodus 14.22, where it talks about um, the Red Sea and how the Israelites came up to the Red Sea and the Egyptians were behind them, about ready to slaughter them or recapture them to take them back to Egypt as slaves. And what did God do for them? part of the sea, and they walked through the dry land of the sea to the other side. So in our baptism, God brings us through um, death, a type of death, and brings us into new life. We die to sin, and we rise to new life in Christ. Because what happens in our baptism is the remission or the forgiveness of sins. So even of there's forgiveness of um, and the cleansing of original sin as well as actual sin. So if you're an adult and you've never been baptized before and you become baptized, all of your sins will be washed away in one action. From the very first sin of your life till the present moment, all of it will be washed away, which is pretty cool. But for those of us who still sin, that's what we have the sacrament of confession for. But we'll talk about that later. So that was Exodus. Um, God leading the people 
through the waters of the Red Sea to dry land, into the promised land, right? So he leads us through the waters of baptism into the promised land of heaven. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Um, there is the New Testament fulfillment. And let's take a look at some of these. What's Matthew 3.16? Can someone that look, look that up for me? Matthew 3.16. Um, for the future, if you all could bring your Bibles with you, that would be great. Um, and uh, I'm going to be giving you um, a, other, another book, too. And if you could bring that with you, that would be great. Okay, go ahead, Carlos. I mean, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, uh, wrong name. <laughs> I should remember Mark. <laughs> Marco. Yeah. After Jesus was, was baptized, he came out into the water, and behold, the heavens were open before him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And a voice came from the heavens, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom. So Jesus Christ was baptized. Did he need baptism? Did he need to be forgiven of sin? No. So why was he baptized? To be one of us and to be an example to us. In other words, he's saying, do as I do. I was baptized, I want you to be baptized. Matthew twenty eight nineteen. Could someone look that up? Matthew is in the New Testament. So it's chapter twenty eight, and then it's verse nineteen. Garrett, do you have it? So, um, is, so is it before the... Go ahead. Um, is it at the entrance of the city? Let's see. Yeah, I'm sorry. Matthew. Am I reading that right? Uh, no. There's Matthew 1. This is 2, so you need to go to 28. Oh, okay, yeah. gotcha. Close. That's 20, so you need 28. It's okay. Chapter 28, and then we need um, this one. Yeah, that verse. Excellent. So, go therefore, make disciples, make other followers of Jesus in my name, right? That's what he's saying. And baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So this isn't something that the church just made up. It was a command of Jesus to baptize in the name of the Trinity. Very good. So Jesus, at the River Jordan, was baptized by, anyone remember? By John. Were they related? Yep. 
they were cousins, right? And so um, what happened in that scene was a revelation of the Trinity. Here we have a revelation of the three persons. So Jesus was baptized at the River Jordan by St. John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit is present in the form of a dove. And then the Father's voice is heard. He declares that Jesus is his, is his beloved Son in whom he is well pleased. So that's where baptism comes from. And it's important because Jesus himself said it was important. And he was baptized even though he didn't need to be baptized. That was a good example for us. In the Great Commission, which Garrett just read, um, it means that Jesus also sends us out to make other followers of Jesus, to make disciples, and to bring other people into baptism by bringing them to the church. So there are other New Testament quotes about baptism. There is St. Peter at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down upon the church. He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is where sometimes some Christian denominations will baptize in the name of Jesus Christ instead of in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that's not what we do. So we receive the Holy Spirit beginning in our baptism, but those graces are sealed in our confirmation. And I'll talk more about that next week. So the apostles also baptized. And said, believe, this was St. Peter, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. The jailer was baptized at once with all his family. So Peter um, was uh, let out of the prison and the jailer came to belief in Christ and was baptized. St. Paul on baptism said, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into his death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So that's also in the Bible. I've already talked about matter and form. They are administered and uh, administered by and received by the essential rite of baptism. So in other words, you have to have the right matter because matter matters <laughs> and the right form. And there is something called, also called baptism of water, baptism of blood, and baptism of desire. Let's say you had someone who was in the process of RCIA, walks out of here, and gets hit by a car and dies. Not that that's going to happen to any of you, right? God would look at them and say, if they've never been baptized, he would say, he would see their desire and consider it baptism by virtue of the fact of their desire, right? So that's baptism of desire. Baptism of blood would be those who have died for Christ that weren't baptized, but they actually died for God. So that would be considered baptism of blood. But most of the time, we are baptized by water. 
So what does baptism do for us? What are its effects? First of all, we have purification from sin. We are purified of our sin. We become a new new creation or a new creature. Um, We are incorporated into the family of the Trinity and also into the life of the church. We begin the process of beginning of oneness with Jesus in faith and baptism. When I am one with Jesus, his dad becomes our dad, so God the Father becomes our father. His mother, Mary, becomes our mother, and his spirit becomes our spirit, the Holy Spirit. Before baptism, we were all one with Adam, which means death. When we are one with Christ in baptism, we have eternal life. We become members of God's family, but only fully initiated in confirmation and Eucharist. So we become full members of the church when we receive all three sacraments of initiation. Baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. We've, another effect of baptism is we become an adoptive son or daughter of God. We receive an indelible mark, an indelible mark of baptism. It's like a spiritual tattoo that never can be removed. Are there souls in hell that were baptized? Yes. Because while they where they chose, right, to be in hell, because God doesn't send anyone to hell, right? Hell is a reality. It's for souls that have zero love in their hearts, right? They're just purely evil. They've chosen evil. Um, But if they've gone through baptism and they don't live out their baptismal life, It doesn't mean anything. It didn't take effect in their life. But they still have that indelible mark on their soul. So permanently marked, there is a seal upon the soul. We become consecrated for worship and sealed on the day of redemption. Okay, so... Living our baptism, if we live out our baptismal life, we can look forward to heaven, basically, if we live that out. And it's really two steps, renouncing the works of the evil one and affirming our faith in God, affirming our belief in God. So how can we live the baptismal life? Well, first of all, we need faith. And we need to constantly renew our baptismal vows because in baptism we made vows to God that we would live for him. And even if we were baptized as babies, our godparents promised on our behalf that we would live for him. Baptism isn't just something that happened once and that's it. We're called to live as his sons and daughters and his family and live as a family. It's a living reality. It's a real thing. Um, We also want to renounce the works of the evil one and affirm our belief in God. That's what it means to live out a baptismal life. How can we renounce the works of the evil one? We can do that by simply praying a prayer In the name of Jesus, I renounce Satan and all his works, right? If he's tempting you to anger, to act out in anger, in the name of Jesus, I renounce this anger. In the name of Jesus, I renounce lust. In the name of Jesus, I renounce pride. In the name of Jesus, I renounce envy. Any of the seven deadly sins, Um, we can renounce in the name of Jesus. 
that's living out your baptismal life. Because when we're tempted, we want to renounce that temptation. So the evil one's attack is on God's children. Why? Can God, can the devil get at God directly? Why not? Can the devil attack God directly? Why can't the devil do that? He's holy? holy. Yeah. He's holy. He's all-powerful. He's much greater than the devil. The devil is just a creature of God, an angel. Some, someone that God created, right? So how does the devil get at God? How can he get at God? Because he can't get at God directly. So, through us. Because it hurts his heart whenever we choose to sin. So there is a battle out there. Believe me, there's a huge battle. And if you have difficult things that happen to you this year and following RCIA after you receive your sacraments, do not be surprised at the spiritual attack that you might have. Forewarned is forearmed. You're in a battle. Pick up the weapons of the sacraments, of prayer, of scripture. Um, Ask the saints to pray for you. Reach out to a friend when you're going through difficult times. Those attacks take different forms and different shapes. The evil one is going to tempt you. I'm going to be very honest, but he's going to tempt you not to go to Mass anymore. He's going to say, you can just pray at home on your own, but can you receive the Eucharist at home on your own? I don't think so. Last time I checked, I don't have that power to make the Eucharist, right? So we want to renounce the lies of the devil and his works. The evil one doesn't want us to realize our identity as sons and daughters of God that we share in the family of the Trinity. And it's been the same thing since the beginning of time. The devil wants us to doubt God's goodness and love. That's what he did to Adam and Eve. Did God really say that to you? That, that's putting a doubt in their minds. Basically, the doubt was, is God really that good? Right? Because he said, eat of any tree except for this one tree. But God was protecting them. And you think, why would God even allow a tree in the garden that they're not supposed to eat? Because he wanted them to be free to choose him. Right? Because if that wasn't there, then they wouldn't be free to choose. And God is such a loving God that he gives us the ability to choose. The devil will try to make us believe that we are nothing. And he's such a liar. He is a total liar. Because he'll say to you one minute, you know, don't, uh, he'll say one minute, he'll say, go do that. It's no big deal. And the next minute after you do it, you're like, he's like, why did you do that? That's such a big deal. You're an awful person and blah, 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 blah. He's such a liar. We need to renounce the lies of the devil. He'll say things like you're all alone, that you're nobody, that you're trash, right? We begin to believe these lies in our head that I'm no good, that I'm stupid, whatever I may be. Whatever your tape is in your head, that CD that keeps playing over and over again, renounce those lies. That's the way that you live out your baptism. How many of us believe the following? I'm all alone. 
I'm bad, I'm no good, I'm stupid, I'm ugly, I never get it right, I'm a burden. These are the lies of the evil one. This is not who we are, and this is not how the Father sees us. He will make us try to believe that we have to earn God's love. This is also not true. We don't have to earn God's love. We are loved because of who we are and not because of what we do. When Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and the Father said, what? You are my beloved son. Yeah. He hadn't done anything yet in his public ministry. That means that he loved Jesus because of who he is. So that's the same way that the Father loves us. He loves us because of who we are. So the Father's love for us is not performance-based. We don't have to earn God's love. If only I had straight A's. If only I uh, got this job. If only then I'll be lovable. No, that's not true. Did you know that the Father looks upon each of us with the same amount of pleasure that he looks at Jesus? Why? Because in baptism we are baptized into Christ. We become one with him. In other words, the Father is loving Jesus in us. Now, that's the first part of living our baptism, is to renounce the evil one and his lies, right? The other part is to announce God's truth and to believe his promise, to believe in his promise. We are sons and daughters of the king, heirs of the kingdom. That means we're royalty. Each of you is a prince or a princess of the Father. We're royalty. We have great dignity and value. We become one with Jesus, sons in baptism. So we become sons in the Son of God, sons and daughters. We become beloved sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father through adoption. This is our, our identity and this is who we are. We only come to know who we are in our identity through the family. So we can only know who we are through the Trinity and through the church. We are beloved sons and beloved daughters of God. And if you're not baptized yet, you will become a beloved son or a beloved daughter of God. Our baptismal life is continually turning away from sin. So if this is sin, I'm turning away from sin, right? And turning to God, right? Baptism gives us the grace to stay within the heart of God's family, the family of the Trinity. Any questions about baptism, its effects, um, why it's important, or anything about baptism in general? No? Okay. We're going to take some time to um, break up into small groups. Um, so, if maybe could you guys join over there? And then you two, if you could join over there. <clears throat> 